to the second Meet the President webinar featuring Rodney Smola. We're excited to have a relatively small group of swans with us today, which should provide an opportunity for a more intimate conversation. My name is Andrew Lane. I am Vice President for Alumni Relations and Development at Vermont Law and Graduate School. I had the honor of serving as a member of the 2022 Presidential Search Committee and am so pleased to help introduce the new president today. Uh, before I begin, just some quick logistics. After I introduce Rod, he will offer some brief remarks about where VLGS finds itself in the landscape of higher ed and in this moment of American political history. I'll ask a few questions to get things started, but this is really about giving you all an opportunity to engage. So we are planning to leave at least 30 minutes for questions from alumni. To ask a question, please use the chat feature, which is located on your Zoom toolbar. Again, because it's a relatively small group, you can also feel free to raise your hand if that's a more convenient way to do it. And we're gonna do our very best to get through as many questions as possible in the time allotted. Finally, just to disclose this webinar is being recorded and may be used for a variety of purposes following today's event. Now, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Rod Smola. He is a graduate of Yale and the Duke University School of Law, a distinguished scholar and litigator in the areas of constitutional law and civil liberties. Rod also has extensive experience in higher education administration. He's a former university president at Furman, and a three-time former law dean at Richmond, Washington and Lee, and most recently Delaware. Rod and his wife Anya relocated to Stratford, Vermont in June, prior to him becoming the first standalone president of Vermont and Law and Graduate School on July 1st. Rod, the floor is yours. Thanks, Andy, and thanks everybody for being here. It's such a small group that I think we can be very informal and conversational and it's a free country so you don't have to put your cameras on but if you're inclined i'd be delighted to have you do that then i can kind of see your faces and uh and and feel a little more human what bruce springsteen called the human touch you know so i i i'm, I'm pleased for those of you that are, that are willing to do that um so i'm going to actually start off with a question that was prompted by um by Andy's introduction. I suppose I should already have researched this and know this, but um, I don't think I remember from English or from history or from biology, what is the what is a group of swans called? Somebody, so maybe somebody's going to Google it. Maybe Bobby's Googling it right now. I was afraid to Google it because I'm afraid I'd mess it up. But you know, you'd think we would know that. I wonder if there is a Geese are a gaggle, right? A bevy, a herd, a game, or a flight. Really? Wow, and that's I, a lot of different. Probably like the most. That's got to be the world record for, for groups. And when they're grounded, they're a bank of swans. Wow. How does that compare with your research, Bob? Is that what you're finding? <laughs> uh, a group of swans... Also, once game birds is a wedge when they're in flight. Wow. I don't know. But can I just say, to digress, yeah. I learned this past summer that a collection of loons is called an asylum of loons, wow. which I just think is spectacular. And that is, do you think that's where we got the, the, the pejorative loony? I'm not sure which came first, the chicken, which, the chicken or the wild. loon. Yeah, that's wild. That's wild. Well, for those of you that were hoping for something more intellectual and serious, sorry to disappoint you. Uh, so let me just share a few things that I am uh, about right now, and uh, I'll share a few substantive thoughts with you as well. Uh, and then I'll be delighted to have a meandering conversation. So this is actually uh, one of my favorite times of the year, one of my favorite times of the academic season, because this is when students return to school, or in some cases come for the first time. So here this week, we began uh, a thing called our Jumpstart program, which allows students to come a week ahead of time 
to try to get some head start on thinking like a lawyer and classes and the study of law and so on. So I got to welcome that group earlier this week. Uh, it was They were filled with nervousness, but excitement and anticipation. It was, it was great to see them. And then Monday, we have orientation for the entering class. And uh, so I'll be part of that all day long. I'll be welcoming the students and participating with them in a number of um, a number of events. And then a tradition that many of you know about that is really fairly rare. Uh, the entire class will be taking a field trip to Montpelier to be sworn in uh, as, you know, newcoming, incoming law students. I told the students this week, I don't like to refer to law students as students. I, I, I like to think of them as lawyers from the first day they're here. Uh, or, or, or LITs, lawyers in training. And, and, uh, and and so I'll, that'll be part of the messaging I'll be doing when I'm with that group uh, in the Capitol and they get to, I hope, get, become impressed with the importance of, of, of all that they're doing. And then the upper class students uh, in a lot of our different programs, our graduate programs that are, that are new and coming online and our uh, more traditional law programs will be coming the following week. We have this brand new online hybrid JD program that has 20 students, which is the max we're allowed. And they're coming for their in-person experience uh, in early September, and I'll be part of that. And, but they'll be, have already started uh, their online experience at that point. And so uh, all of that's exciting. And just two thoughts um, to conjure for you, maybe your own experiences. Um, one is, you know, students come to law schools, and I think maybe come to lots of different academic programs, filled with anticipation and excitement and, and idealism and altruism. And sometimes law schools can crush that. Sometimes we can snuff it out, and it becomes a grind, and, it be, and it's not what they thought they were going to get. And, you know, they come kind of hoping they're going to have an influence on the world, and and it, and, and it can bum them out that it's, that it's difficult and, and maybe in the early days dry. And we wanna be careful we never do that. We wanna be careful that we constantly reinforce the importance of what they're doing. And, uh, and I think that, that uh, one of the roles I'll be playing is um, trying to meet with students often in a lot of different settings and a lot of different um, uh, programmatic um, uh, ways and to, and to keep that spirit inside them going, to keep that notion that um, this is a, a noble profession, an important profession, the world desperately needs it and not to lose sight of that. And, you know, the, the Vermont Law and Graduate School is unique in, in the panoply of American education and really world education. There's no place, I think, that you could point to, no other law school in the, in the country you could point to that has been so intentionally and deliberately in existence for things larger than itself. You know, causes like environmental justice, restorative justice, which um, Bobby has been so instrumental in, are, are so important to the future of the, of the country and future of the world. And that's admirable. But, but we also know that only a, only a, some of our graduates will become public interest lawyers in the in, in the in the in, in the actual sense. But one of my messages is only some of you will become public interest lawyers. But I hope you'll all practice in the public interest. You know, whatever you do, whether you're working for a, a big law firm, whether you're working for a government agency, whether you're a prosecutor or a defense lawyer, whether you're working for a nonprofit. Whatever field you enter, um, that you have that sense that you're part of, uh, of something bigger than yourselves and, and have certain obligations that are larger than yourselves. The other thing I'll, I'll be sharing with a lot of our students next week particularly is to invite them to reflect on the difference between this group, and I don't know how many there are around the country, what do you think? Um, I don't know, 25,000 new law students entering, the, entering law schools, the 200 law schools around the country. 
And at the same time, there are fewer, but still thousands, tens of thousands, I'm, I'm guessing, young medical students entering medical schools around the country. And it's interesting for me to reflect on the difference of, in the psychology uh, of those two things. And, and on, on this score, I really like medical schools better than law schools. And, and that is to say, I think, I hope I'm not wrong, but I think that when a young person be, decides they wanna become a doctor and they go to medical school, their patients that they know they're gonna have someday are at the front of their mind from the very beginning of that. They know there's gonna come a day when they're gonna to have to diagnose somebody, treat somebody, heal somebody. And I would like to think that all the people I've visited as doctors over the years worked hard in medical school because they, you know, I don't wanna go and the person says, oh, I didn't go that day. You know, I mean, I hope that they that they're thinking about they're part of a healing art and a profession from the very beginning, and they want to be the best doctors they can be because they want to be able to serve their patients as, 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 as well as they can. And, you know, law schools very often forget that we are in a similar kind of healing art. I mean, we are counseling people. We are taking people in crisis. We are taking people trying to do positive things. We are we are also you know, client centered. And the, we sometimes think of ourselves, I think too much as, as this is an intellectual enterprise. It, of course it is, but it's also, it's a service enterprise. And, and I'll be trying to communicate that to the, to the law students. And even the graduate students who are coming in in our new graduate programs and are gonna be public policy oriented and not, not, will not be practicing law or doing this for the purpose of practicing law for the most part, um, e even they are are there for 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 important causes. It's not just it's not just an abstract academic um, exercise. So those are some of the thoughts that have been in my on on my mind. I, I um, one of the things that you do this time of year is you start to put the materials together to market the schools for the new admission season that is about to that is about to. Um, uh, uh, start. I mean, we're we're already recruiting students for next fall, and and for the and, and for next summer. And I wrote a I wrote a a recruitment letter to include in those materials this morning for the two schools, for the graduate school and the law school. And they're they're different. Um, they have some overlapping themes, and some of the things I've just suggested to you are are, are part of that. So uh, the, the last thing I'm going to do, just for ten minutes or so, um, is uh, you talk about a theme that uh, at least one or two of you have heard me talk about before, but, but most of you haven't. And this is just a lame uh, excuse for me to teach a little constitutional law, even though, even though you didn't come here for a constitutional law lecture. But I, I actually have some, some, uh, some reasoning behind it. For a long time, I've been of the view that in the United States, our constitutional traditions are more than just law. They seep into our identity as a country. They seep into all of our institutions. And they particularly have had a huge influence on uh, the shape of American universities, including American law schools. So the, the modern American university, which began to really kind of take the shape that we think of it uh, as in, in the 19th century, was a bit of a departure from the European traditions that we inherited. And I think that departure is influenced by the United States Constitution. And this may be a superficial comparison, but to my mind, it's not. Uh, it's fascinating how so much of the vocabulary and the thought processes that we use in American constitutional law have analogs in higher education. So in constitutional law, one of the themes is separation of powers, the role of the president, the role of the Congress, the role of the courts. We have similar notions of separation of powers at universities. There are things over which the faculty is treated as a kind of sovereign, almost like a Congress. There are executive positions like the one that I have. Um, there are um, uh, adjudicatory bodies that, that resolve disputes somewhat in the way that courts do. And there are people that um, uh, are at all levels of, of, of the institutions, 
folks like you that have graduated from schools, uh, people that are working in the schools now, people that are attending the schools now, that occupy roles somewhat like our, our, our constitutional polity. We also think a lot about um, federalism in the constitutional scheme. So one of the constant tugs and pulls of American life are what things should be national and what things should be local on, and, and what things should be centralized and what things should be decentralized. The huge debates we've had over the um, overturning of Roe v. Wade is a classic example of that, but it's been part of the American experience um, from the beginning. And universities are similar. Um, even, even, even the Vermont Law and Graduate School has a, a dizzying array of programs. I still, I still don't know the names of them all. I haven't visited them all yet. Um, and there's this fascinating tug and pull, how much of it should all be centralized and how much of it should be entrepreneurial and decentralized and people are free to, 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 to move in their own directions and be creative. I tend to like that second model a lot on, on, on many things, even though we have certain things that unite us and, and, and are part of it. And then finally, you know, the most important contribution, I think, um, in, in the American constitutional experience um, to the world has been the idea of rights, the idea that we have basic human rights um, that we protect and can be asserted against the government. Uh, democracy existed for 2,000 years before the United States came into existence, but we're the, we were the first place really to say that people possess certain rights and they can, and they can litigate and advocate on the basis of those and, and, um, and people that are in, in the minority and their political views and their religious views and their, and their ideological views um, in their identity um, have a right to um, insist on being treated with, with, with dignity and respect and freedom. And, and that's really unique. And I think that's a central part of what American universities should be at at their best and what law schools should be at, at their best. And so when I approach this new position with a lot of humility and a lot of excitement and a, a lot of optimism for the future, um, I, I do it having been influenced in my life so much by, by these comparisons and by my um, optimism, despite all of the rough, rough times we are in in the United States and around the world for, for the future. I'll end by, by saying, you know, what I've so strongly emphasized in my messaging to the students as they've come in and in uh, the future messaging I'll, uh, I'm doing is, how important it is that this school has always existed for things larger than itself and how critical those things are today. I mean, we are at a breaking point, a crisis point with regard to climate change. And we are experiencing you know, challenges to the rule of law and to human dignity in this country and around the world that are uh, intimidating and frightening and deeply challenging and how important it is that this school is a school designed to equip people with the intellectual skills, but also the competencies and practical judgment um, to try to make a difference in those arenas. And, and I, that, that's something you should all be very proud of. I'm very proud to be a new member of that effort. And uh, whether people participate in it, literally in the Green Mountain State, which I've already fallen in love with, and 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 uh, and and uh, it's it's magical for me as a newcomer. Um, it, it has been for my wife as well. Um, or they participate remotely, as more of our students are going to be doing. Uh, I hope that they get that sense of of purpose and community and meaning. So I think that's enough for me to say at the beginning, and I'm looking forward to a very informal conversation. I think there are some chat questions and maybe someone, if they want to read me a chat question or two, can do that. Uh, and, but I, I also don't want to stand on formalities. So just unmute yourself and dive in and jump in as part of a conversation if, that's, if that suits you better. Yeah, Rod, why don't we actually start with, we have a couple of questions from Joel in the chat. Um, the first is <clears throat> VLGS is a small independent school. Do you see it staying small and independent? And then the follow on, which is related is, what kind of law school do you see us being in five or 10 years? Yeah, so I certainly see it remaining 
uh, independent. That is to say, I don't think there's any appetite, certainly not from me, to try to merge with Dartmouth or the University of Vermont or any larger entity. I, I will be selfishly honest. One of the things that attracted me to the job is it's independence. And I know some, you, know, you always, the grass always looks greener on the other side sometimes. So I think sometimes folks here have said, oh, wouldn't it have been great if we were part of some giant university, then, then we would have all this other infrastructure to support us and so on. But I've been there, done that, you know, and there are pros and cons. And, uh, and there's a lot more dexterity and a lot more, in, a lot more opportunities to do the things that we think are the right things to do because, because we had that independence. And so I think that part of it is easy. You know, small versus large. My guess is that the scale we are currently at will be the scale indefinitely. Um, the, the JD program uh, this, this fall, so this week, uh, we're bringing in about, about 170 students, about 150 residential students and another 20 um, online students. Wouldn't bother me a bit to see that go up a little bit, um, to go up by 10 or 15 over the next, over the next few years, if the market will bear it um, and uh, if we have the resources to support it. Uh, that could be very helpful financially. Um, and, and so I don't see us you know, doubling in size or going up by a gigantic amount, but I could see 10, 15% of the basic JD program in that ballpark um, uh, as something that might happen. One of the things we always have to keep a weather eye on is our bar passage. And I, I, that's something I've been deeply involved in a lot. I'll be happy to talk to you about it more in this conversation if you're interested in it. And so we wouldn't wanna bring in more students and, and um, undercut our goal to, I mean, my goal to have everybody pass the bar exam the first time, but at least if not everybody, almost everybody, and uh, be very, very, very robust in, in the, our bar passage rates down the road. So that's, that's part of it. We have, a, uh, we have another um, uh, natural restraint on our residential programs, and that's the housing problem that exists all over the country, but it exists acutely in Vermont. We don't have enough housing for students here. It was unbelievably frightening for me and my wife to find a house. I mean, we were just, we were afraid we, we'd have to live in a yurt, you know, which might've been okay, but, but we, you know, houses would go on the market at eight in the morning and we would make an offer not having been to, the, to see them and they would be gone by four o'clock in the afternoon. I mean, it, we, we were really starting to worry and our students have a real struggle finding affordable housing. That's something we're gonna really, 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 push hard on ways that we can create more housing here in South Wales and for the students, perhaps even on our campus. Um, but that's a restrainer. Now, the, the, there's another piece to the question where I can, I, I'm hoping there will be good growth. I'm hoping our master's programs will grow substantially. And that's one of the important pieces of our strategic plan to design our new master's programs. They'll be part of the graduate school and to really see them move upward um, with, with um, you know, healthy, uh, healthy growth. And that will be, that will first of all, be good for society to have these students with these abilities in things like, um, you know, expertise in climate change, environmental justice, uh, animal protection, restorative justice, all those arenas. Um, but it will be good for us financially. It'll, it'll make it a more interesting, um, uh, uh, diverse intellectual environment, but also help us on the financial side. And a fair number of those programs are online. And so you don't have the housing restraint. And I think that capacity can go up and, and we're expecting it to go up. I don't have a magic number as to the total enrollment that we would have. Um, I can't see it getting much bigger than, I don't know, 800 students all in, if you count the master's programs, the online programs, the residential programs, et cetera. And that's probably four or five years from now that we would, we would get to that number. 
Um, so anyway, I hope that's a I hope that helps you get a sense of the of the scale issue. Um, so the other, you know, the other um, part of the question is is a uh, you know, where will the school be five years from now? I think was basically the question. And the strategic plan that was there when I became the new president, it had already been created, essentially provides the answer for that. Um, it will be both a law school and a graduate school. It is already, but the graduate side of it is a work in progress, the graduate side we're recruiting the faculty, we're designing the programs, we're rolling it out. But that process should be done five years from now, and it should be up and running five years from now. Uh, financial stability, you know, the school should be operating with a financial surplus at that point. Um, it's a, we are a nonprofit, you know, we, we don't have investors that wanna make, uh, th that are in it to make money, but we wanna be building a cushion. We don't wanna be operating you know, negatively. And so the rolling out of all these different programs, um, driving enrollment, driving fundraising to make sure that we're stable. So the school is here forever um, is enormously important. Um, and the substance of the programs, I think, I, I, I think there's no question that the, that the two of the core identities, the commitment to environmental justice and the commitment to things like restorative justice and maybe a more broader conception of some of that, um, uh, um, uh, uh, some, some broader commitment to social justice, I think will be a core part of the identity of the school. Yet, as I suggested at the beginning, um, we are a full service school. We educate students to do everything and, and students may love coming to Vermont because they love the environment, they may like the values that it stands for, but they maybe end up practicing family law in San Francisco. We don't know, you know, our students do a million different things and we have to make sure we give them a great education on that score. Last thing I'll say, and then I'll, I don't wanna make my answers too long, but I've been a, a crusader uh, forever for experiential learning and for the idea that it's not all book learning because that's not what the law, that's not what law practice is. Um, and giving students the opportunity to, to have real client experiences and experience the real world and develop a lot of those things that are so day in and day out what matters in law practice. Um, interacting with clients, interacting with co-counsel, interacting with opposing counsel, interacting with, with decision makers, um, counseling folks, uh, you know, all those sorts of things, the, developing judgment, which is so hard. Um, are things that I think have been underemphasized in American legal education, not so much um, underemphasized here. It's been an important part of the identity of uh, Vermont Law and Graduate School, and I'm a real crusader for that. And, and I'm hoping that, that, that those opportunities expand and um, that that continues to be a core part of the school's identity. So we have two kind of related questions in the chat about the uh, online learning. And I think this is uh, particularly focused on the master's side of the house. Um, so I'll read them both. The first is, uh, I know many master's students opted to participate online because of the shortage of housing. Uh, any thoughts on how we might address that? You talked about that briefly, but I wanna make sure you give it um, airtime. And then secondly, how do you see the school creating more connections between online students, residential students, and the broader community? What are challenges associated with growing numbers of online students? Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll talk about housing first. Um, we have formed a, a committee of the Board of Trustees to look at the housing issue, and it is a major point of, of urgency and emphasis for me. So among the things that are on the table, the, the board has not approved any of this. And I, have to, I don't wanna be in front of the board. It's, it will be the board's decision. But one of the things that we will be, I think, likely to do is um, explore the possibility of building um, housing on our campus, so on our property, 
Um, who knows what the details of that would be, but just, you know, roughly something like 30, 35, 40 units, probably apartment style units, maybe single person, maybe, maybe, you know, some two bedrooms or whatever. Um, in, in conjunction with a, with, with a, a developer and, uh, and, uh, you know, I, I think it's very possible that we will put out um, requests for proposals and see if there are private developers with an interest. We, we, we know candidly there are already. Um, and it would, it would probably, from the moment I'm talking to you now, to see that actually happen, if everything went brilliantly, it would be two years from now. I mean, if you just think about the, 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 the permitting processes, the, fi the financing processes, the architectural, let alone building, um, but uh, that would be great. Uh, we also know that there are per persons interested in creating new housing in South Royalton, um, that it would not be on our campus, but obviously one of the main drivers is that that students, faculty, staff members, et cetera, would be part of that. And I just met with somebody yesterday that that is interested in, in doing that. So I'm hoping there will be positive movement in that direction. And that will help a bit with all of all of our in-person residential admissions um, uh, uh, enrollment. Now there's an entirely different question, I think, which is, I guess I, I, I'd say it has a couple of pieces to it. One is how do you deliver quality educational experiences online? And the second is how do you capture a sense of community, um, which is so palpable for people that live here. People who live here feel the spirit, they feel the camaraderie, they feel the, the, the social interactions that they have with one another. It's a big part of the experience how can you do that in a, in a virtual environment? And I think the answer is, well, it's, it's, you probably can't exactly replicate it. It's gonna, it's gonna be a different kind of community. And you may have better insights about that than I do. I'll just say this, I may be a bit of a heretic, but I taught uh, a lot online during the pandemic because in my prior position as dean, I taught a full faculty load. Um, I even taught above a full faculty load. So I taught um, uh, basic four credit and two credit constitutional law courses every single semester. And I taught some uh, courses in the graduate programs that the Delaware Law School had. And I, I was, once we got the hang of it, I was surprised at the intellectual exchange and quality of that we were able to capture. And in, in, you had, I, I had to invent new things. I had to reinvent the way I taught to some degree, but it worked out really well. So I'll just give you a little small example. Um, I teach the basic constitutional law course. And one of the things that I did that I hadn't done before when I taught it in person was Fairly often, we would just stage Supreme Court arguments. And so instead of, instead of studying Roe v. Wade, we would conduct an argument over whether Roe should be retained or overruled. Or instead of studying affirmative action, we would do an argument over whether it should be declared unconstitutional or not. And we would do the, we had this very interesting process. We did it on Zoom. Um, I would form nine person courts and we would do an argument and then they would all go off into their own rooms and deliberate and then they'd come back and deliver their opinions. And I felt they were more deeply engaged in some way than in the traditional way. So you can create interaction and, and, uh, and you can create community and you can create intellectual vibrancy, uh, but you gotta work at it. You gotta be thinking about uh, how best to do it. The hybrid program for the JDs does involve some residential experiences in Vermont, but I would be, it would be disingenuous to say it's anything like living in South Royalton. Of course, it's not going to be quite the same, but I'm hoping we can, I'm hoping we can capture as much of it as possible. One of the really interesting challenges in online programs is how you give 
students real client opportunities, clinical opportunities, those sorts of things. There are schools that, that have been doing that well. Um, I happen to have a lot of friends at the Syracuse Law School. I'm a co-author with a person at Syracuse. They're one of the pioneers in this. And um, they tend to be very generous in sharing, you know, what, what works and what doesn't work. And we'll be looking to folks like that for, for guidance and, and, and help. Great. So um, question just to follow up on your raising the value of experiential learning. How do you see that in being integrated on the graduate school side into the master's degrees? Yeah, so I think it's a different kind of experience, and I suspect it will be um, the kinds of placements that you see in public policy schools and graduate schools in which persons are, are working on projects with, um, with entities, and these could be entities anywhere in the, in the world, or they could be local. Um, and so I, I, I think that that's one of the things that... Uh, Jenny Rushlow, who's the interim dean of the graduate school, and the folks that we are bringing in right now um, will be puzzling through. But I think it's got, um, I, I, I think, again, we'll look to similar sorts of master's programs at other places, including places that have public policy schools, and look at how they have, uh, how they have approached um, giving students that experiential opportunity as opposed to a purely academic classroom opportunity. Mm -hmm. Great, so I wanna make a pitch to uh, folks on the call. Please uh, type your questions in the chat or if that's too cumbersome, raise your hand and you can unmute yourself and ask yourself. Um, I have another question for Rod just to keep us rolling. And, and that's if you could kind of walk us through the thinking behind the name change, which is always a popular uh, topic of conversation among alums. So you know the 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 substance is probably what matters. There was a very very thoughtful, deliberate decision to make um, the 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 non JD side of the educational effort a stronger with with stronger enrollment um, and uh, and and not entirely law focused but policy focused. And I think, it, I think it came from two drivers. Of course, I wasn't there, but it, it, I think it came from two drivers. One was the perception that there is a market for these programs. So this was on one level, a business decision that these programs would be attractive, that, they would, that students would be interested in them and that that would be good for the school financially. Um, and that the marketing of it would be enhanced by this separateness, by this, by it, it being grounded in its own identity. So I think that was a piece of it. Um, another piece of it is that some of it was already being done. There already were master's programs, and and so it wasn't like this was not the, you know out of the blue. So it was more um, to invest in it to make it more to make it more robust. Once you made that decision. Once, you, once the school made the decision substantively and as a business matter to invest in that side of the enterprise, then the second decision that came was it, it will get lost if it's, if it's not reflected in the name. And, and giving it the name um, is, is sort of saying, we're all in. We believe this is the right thing to do. We believe these two identities are both important. We want, we want it to have um, uh, a name that reflects that new investment in those new programs. And so I think that's the reason for the name. Um, it, I will just tell you, it was very interesting when I wrote this morning, the two messages I had to write for the two recruiting view books. So we're gonna have a we're gonna have a book that we give to prospective students that are interested in the law school. We have another book that we'll be giving to students that are interested in the graduate school. Um uh Zha Yu Zhang, who's on the call here, will be one of the people leading some of these partnerships around the around the world. And 
I, I really had to think through my use of the English language. So it, 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 sometimes I refer to Vermont law and graduate school, but sometimes I refer to the law school and sometimes I refer to the graduate school. Uh, and, and I tried to strike the right balance. Um, so that's, I think, I, I think the name change is good. I think it will help us a lot in the non-JD recruiting. I think it'll help us a lot on the international side and international recruiting. And, um, and I'm I'm 100 for it. Uh, you know I have been around enough to know some people uh, some people resist name changes, but uh, you know remember remember Romeo and Juliet. What's in a name? A rose by any other name is just as sweet. <laughs> That's great. Uh, we have another question here. It's a it's a it's a tricky one. Uh, with a decentralized innovative graduate structure. How do you and others stay in the loop on what is happening in all of the different programs? So it's a challenge for me. And, and the simple answer is I visit the programs. Um, I, I was at a program with, with Bobby Sand and, and, and others um, on restorative justice last week, I think it was. And we had Senator Leahy's staff with us there. And there were 13 or 14 people around the room, some inside the, the, the uh, law and graduate school, some around the state um, that uh, were per participating in restorative justice programs. And I sat there mainly and listened and I learned a lot. And part of what my job is gonna be to, to just keep making the rounds and doing that with all of our different programs, um, sitting in, you know, learning about them, even teaching in them a bit. I, I'm not teaching my own load of courses because the trustees and others wanted me to really be pushing on some of these other things. But I'm sitting in as a guest the guest teacher in a lot of a lot of courses in a number of the different programs. I'm, for example, um, going to be teaching in a couple of weeks in one of our um, animal rights, animal protection advocacy programs. And you might think, well, what on earth could I possibly know about that? But it turns out in my world of uh, First Amendment law, there's a lot of intersection between advocacy on behalf of, uh, of uh, animal rights and, uh, and attempts to curb that advocacy. And that'll be my little wrinkle uh, that I'll use to do that. Um, now I'm, I'm gonna answer a little bit more philosophically. Um, I think that uh, there are certain themes that everybody at the law and graduate school will adhere to. So, you know, we'll have the same logo, we'll have the same name. If people ask, are you moving the school to Burlington? Everybody will say no. Um, you know, there are certain things, there are certain things that are part of our identity that everybody should, 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 should echo. But then I believe in creativity and decentralization and letting people run and letting people feel that they're not being micromanaged and they have their energy to move in their own direction. And it's more my job to get behind those, to, that creativity and to help it and see how I can serve it than to stifle it and say, you know, everything's got to come through um, the Kremlin. All right. So I shouldn't say my wife's Russian. And so she would, she would laugh if I said what I just said, but I, 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 I believe that, that you, you can hurt um, the energy and creativity uh, of organizations if you try to make everything controlled by the, by the central you know, leadership. So I'm not, that's not my style. Okay, so um, one, one other question that, that I have here on this end is, is there anything that alumni in particular should be looking forward to over the course of the next year in terms of engagement with you, engagement with the school, anything that they should be watching for um, in, in terms of announcements down the road? Mm -hmm. So I'll be on the road. I'm looking forward to that. I think I, I think we already have, um, Andy knows it better than I do, but I think in, in September I'll be um, uh, in New York and then I'll be in DC. Um, uh, not long. At, well, I know we'll be in Burlington in, in September. I know we have uh, uh, events in Boston. Um, you know, we we have people all over the country, but it is the case that a giant part of our alumni base is from basically Maine to Virginia, and um, and I I will be you know 
visiting a lot, doing events a lot. I, I like visiting a, a, a city and doing and, and visiting some individual donors, visiting, having a larger alumni group, um, you know, cocktail party and, and a chance to visit um, and, and integrating that with recruiting and, and opportunities to um, uh, help with admissions. And so you can expect me to kind of be on the road, uh, you know, a reasonable amount doing that. Uh, one of the beauties of um, that we all learned after the pandemic is that we're going to have events like this, and I'll be doing that um, sometimes substantively, doing you know a, a substantive CLE lecture on 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 some topic that that I know about, which gives me the chance to teach a little bit and and um, and and interact that way. So I think that's important. Uh, we are going to be entering the uh, celebration of the 50th anniversary of the school. And we have lots of creative ideas about ways we're going to do that. It's going to be something we'll do over several years. Um, and that's going to, and Andy may be able to speak better than I can about some of the logistics of that, which will begin, um, will begin in December. One of the models that we're looking at is, um, you know how they how the New Year's Eve celebrations changed because of the pandemic. So you'd have a party in New Orleans and a party in LA and a party in Times Square, and people would be linked and and so on. So we're looking for ways to do some of that socially um, as as part of the 50th anniversary. Um, we're thinking of an of an interesting idea involving swans. We'll have to come up with their collective name, but things like. Uh, swan sculptures and swan paintings and swan artifacts and kind of ways to, to just have fun with that. Um, so I, I think what, what you can expect from me is, is, and I hope you hold me to it, is that I want to be very communicative with you. I want to, I want to be accessible. Um, and I want to meet a lot of folks in person to the extent that, that, that I can. Great. Any final questions from the audience? Okay, Rod, I'll leave it to you to close. All right. Well, um, I, I will uh, let you know the school used to have an, a, a, an installation of its president. And I said, no, I don't want to do that. You know, I don't want to like have all pomp and circumstance and stuff like that. Uh, and I didn't want it to be about me. But, uh, but we are going to start a new tradition and it's going to begin on September 1. Uh, it's, we're going to call it a convocation and I'm going to give a talk. I'm going to give a talk about this tumultuous recent Supreme Court term, and then we're going to let it morph into a party. It's really focused on the students, but anybody who wants to come can come, including people here in, in, in the area. And um, my one of our kids is a jazz musician, and his band's going to play, so that'll be fun. Um, and uh, and I'm hoping that then the, the substantive side of it at least will be um, uh, available down the road. I think it will be if you're interested in that lecture. Um, so I hope it's, uh, if you remember that beautiful last scene in the movie Casablanca where Humphrey Bogart, you know, is walking hand in hand and they talk about this being the beginning of a beautiful friendship. I hope that's the way you feel about this. It's the way I feel about it. And, uh, and I'm, again, thank you all for coming to this and I look forward to other chances to be with you. All right. Well, with that, I just want to Thank everyone for your participation and your thoughtful questions. Of course, thank you to Rod for making yourself available for this and really anything we ask for as it relates to alumni. Uh, so everyone, please keep an eye out for additional opportunities to engage with Rod in the coming months that we think will be fun and exciting and have a great day.